Welcome to the Melt Zone podcast from August 10th, 2019. And this is episode 20, and I'm Tom. And I'm Stefan. And on today's episode, I talk about my upcoming trip to Japan and if it's a good idea to take my camera equipment with me or just stick to my phone. Uh, another topic we are going to talk about is if YouTube is actually the right platform for this podcast. And if we think that it would be a better idea to just, yeah, drop those episodes in the usual podcast player and kind of abandon YouTube. Um, then I actually learned the hard way this week that STLs can get inaccurate if you are exporting them from, la from, from large assemblies and um, just the problems that this format has in general. Also, Tom finally bought his, in my opinion, way too expensive or really expensive lens, but he is going to convince me that it was a purchase worthwhile. It's a value, man. That that's what it, that's what matters. Uh, in other topics, we try to follow up to the topo optimization uh, shelf bracket video. We we, we don't manage to do that. Uh, spoiler alert: uh, we actually end up talking about infrastructures, lattices, and why they're kind of a bad idea, and what we can do instead to make strong and rigid parts. Uh, in the news section today, some sad news: Grant Thompson, the king of random, has died, and we we kind of talk about what well what what impact he's had on our channels and what impact that 50 percent view drop is having that youtube is showing us right now for the topic of the week stefan got his tier time 3d cetus no it's tier time cetus 3d whatever he got the cetus uh, 3d printer which is which is a really nice machine but uses some pretty old drivers or some some pretty well not current generation drivers and we discuss whether, you know, manufacturers should just be putting Trinamage drivers on everything. In the question section, we are answering the question whether we think that PETG will overtake PLA in terms of the most popular standard filament in the future. All right. So, Stefan, this is, this is going to be the last podcast for a while. You're going to be gone. Yeah, I'm going to be gone. Well, uh, I'm not going to be gone for forever, but starting... Well, from the date of recording next week, Friday, I'm going to be in Japan for uh, three weeks, 20 days, something like that. Going to be home at the beginning of September again. And um, I think this is kind of the trip I was or I am the least prepared for. I'm quite happy that my... That the queen of the house kind of <laughs> did all the organiz or, or organization stuff before. Yeah. But I just, oh, I don't know. I was just overwhelmed with work for the last couple of weeks. And yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. The only thing I actually just know is that I still need to organize a... Uh, like a SIM card or Wi-Fi, pocket oh, wow. Wi-Fi for Japan that we have at least a possibility to translate some some Chinese stuff. Yeah, but Chinese? Uh, Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but supposedly Japan is pretty good about that. Um, for some reason, I don't know if it's been YouTube picking up on us talking uh, about your trip, but it's been suggesting life where I'm from, uh, <laughs> the YouTube channel to me, and I've been watching a few of those videos because okay. they're really well done. And there are a few... That that covers stuff like that. Hey, can you get a SIM card? How mm. to you know social standards and, mm. and uh, agreements and all that. And apparently, SIM cards and all that stuff is really simple to get in in Japan. Yeah. Um, as a traveler, so hey, you you should be fine. You I hope fine. I should be fine. And the other thing I know about Japan at the moment is that it's between thirty four to thirty eight <laughs> degrees centigrade in Tokyo at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Bring bring some shorts, definitely. I will bring some shorts. And that actually brings me over to, to the first question I put into our show notes. Because if it's that hot outside, um, what camera gear should I actually take to my trip to Japan? Because I don't really want to like carry around my big camera for, yeah, nah. for the trip, my GH5. Nah, for sure. Uh, I mean, definitely don't bring a Sony. Because you're saying it's 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 gonna be hot there. I worry those might overheat. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sony users, but <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I I would actually say bring your phone. Like, what, yeah. what 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 phone are you rocking these days? I have a OnePlus 6T. That's a decent camera. That, right? That's a decent camera. Um, and actually, to be honest, for the la for the last couple of trips that were only to Italy or like nearer locations yeah. i've just been bringing my my phone with me because it's it's not worth it at the moment and if you also take a look at the amount or the, the sales amount of like small cameras that were yeah. the hype like 10 years ago um nobody was spying them anymore phones make better pictures than most like pocket cameras but the Definitely. thing is since i'm well kind of in this video and 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 image thing ah i think it would feel kind of hard to not take at least my um lumix g x 80 with me that's the compact uh interchangeable lens yeah exactly is panasonic right yeah i mean that's that's uh, that's a bit better than the than the g85 but are you are you really going to be bringing that along and and, and carrying that in <sighs> Not just in your backpack, because if it's in the backpack, you're not going to be using it, right? You, mm. you know, you'd, you'd need to do the Chinese mm. or the, I don't know, Japanese probably do it as well. You know, thing where you have the camera, <laughs> you know, slung around your neck and, and always ready to go. Because, you know, if, if you just have it stored away, the next best thing is going to be your phone because you, you can reach that with one, mm. you know, one simple move. I don't know if I would feel upset for doing that, but I'm really thinking about doing that because... Not only do I need to take the camera with me, it's also like all of the electrical equipment, which goes with chargers and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, a tripod, because yeah, maybe you want to do some some night photography or things like that. And then there's the question about the lens. <laughs> <laughs> do I take lens, my yeah. 25 millimeter 1.7 aperture lens with me for for really nice like night shots? Or do I take my traveling 14 to 140 millimeter lens with me, which has been serving me really well? I don't know. It is all the, additional does stuff. Six, does the 6T have a, a secondary telephoto lens? Uh, yes, it does. It does. Okay. Yeah. So that, there goes the advantage of, of what uh, an interchangeable lens camera would have with a yeah. zoom lens. So you, you have your, your focal lengths uh, in your phone. I don't know if and if you if you just bring the the fourteen to one forty like there's it, it, that's a three f three point five to five point six that's a really dim lens so you're mm -hmm. probably not going to be getting any any better images out of that versus your phone. So. Well, at least in bad lighting conditions, yeah. I don't know well, in good lighting conditions too. Like you you don't get any depth of field. So yeah. Well, with a one hundred and forty millimeter being really far away from objects, you get this depth of field but yeah it's it's dif it's different to it's your new beautiful yeah. lens that you bought <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll talk about that in a second which is i mean that's definitely not a travel lens <laughs> <laughs> it's a beast yeah, I'm, need... <laughs> i i think i need to still make up my head about that for the next couple of days but i'm kind of well thinking about going in the direction of just leaving it at home and yeah. If there's something to take a photo of, we can use our phones um, and otherwise just enjoy the city and everything with your own eyes. Yeah, because that, that's the thing. Like I've 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 enjoyed traveling light, where you you don't have to worry about so many different things. And if you bring, you know, you're probably going to be bringing like some laptop, some phone. You need to charge for those. You need the gear for that. You're going to be uh, traveling with your daily stuff a bottle of water i don't know what what else you bring on your day trips but you already have so much stuff to worry about and then also having to worry about a camera and kind of i don't know it, it's just it, it feels like an extra step of hassle um hmm. that when you you know if you do have your gear yes you have it but that's work like that's yeah. that's business stuff you just enjoy the enjoy yeah. the trip i think there's enough to to take in in, in japan yeah and you rarely uh, take a look at the old images to be honest that you made yeah. on your trips. Well, that's that's the other thing too, right? If you if you take stuff on your phone, you have them immediately available to share with your friends and family. You can you can just plop onto any mm. Wi-Fi and, and and upload stuff. Uh, you have them backed up to Google Photos probably, so they're just always with you immediately. And if you bring a real camera, you still have to take your photos through Lightroom typically, uh, at least to you know adjust the colors. I don't know if you shoot in RAW or not, but 
Um, <laughs> Barely. <laughs> yeah. Well, still, but with with a with a real camera, you, I always get the feeling like you still need to edit the video slightly to make them feel a bit, you know, poppier, a bit bit more lively, mm-hmm. bit whatever. And with a phone, it's it's usually just you know you have the image. You, I don't know. I, I say I say yeah. go with a phone. Go easy yeah. on yourself. Ta- yeah. Make it a vacation. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably right there. <laughs> and and Google Google Photo does actually pretty good auto correction of not that really well lit or exposed images. So yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. I'll be gone for three weeks. So I think there won't be a podcast in two weeks. Maybe yeah. we uh make it work out and have a podcast ready in four or five weeks yeah i'll i'll see if i if i can find a guest who who can who we can uh, record with remotely or who i can remo- record with remotely yeah uh yeah yeah but i'm i, I i've got the, the homer simpson quote here i'm envious about your your vacation to uh to japan i'm not jealous i'm envious um <laughs> Yeah, good on good on you that that you do get the chance to to really take a vacation and be away from your from your daily uh, grudge and grudge no from your daily grunt work for a while. Yeah, I hope that I am able to put the phone away from time to time. Don't always check social media and views and comments and things like these because ah, uh, that's just that's just making the holiday less a holiday. Yeah, it, it does take you out of it. Uh, do you have any any like maker spaces or, or manufacturer visits or anything like that planned? Or is it really <sighs> not just yet? Um, I will tweet out. I think well today or tomorrow, uh, and maybe there is something coming up. There there is something interesting which I have seen at Form Next almost two years ago. There was a Japanese company that was showing off four D printing filaments, so shape memory polymers oh right Ooh. yeah and i actually have a roll of that filament <laughs> sitting in my shelf for two years now and i haven't touched it but this would be something worthwhile taking a look at maybe i write those guys i think they are in tokyo or in hiroshima so it mm, it, it would be a possibility to visit them but i don't know otherwise uh, i don't know if i really want to connect my holiday with like work <laughs> Yeah. totally understandable and probably the right choice there yeah. cool should we I, I guess we i guess we kind of teased it and we've been talking yeah. about the um <laughs> about it on the podcast before i got i finally got my dream lens for the camera probably something that not a lot not a lot of people care about but <laughs> i care about it <laughs> <laughs> i'm excited for it i finally got the panasonic 10 to 25 f 1.7 throughout it's a fantastic lens that it's, was the lens that was teased just like two or three months ago by panasonic well it's been it's been teased for i think since december 18 ah, okay um where they showed off like a really badly 3d printed model uh, of it <laughs> um and then like you know there, there were rumors oh it's gonna be this big this pricey you kept saying oh it's a really expensive lens Yes, because it's, it's two thousand bucks. Well, it's it's two thousand euros. Yes, um, I've, I've already been chatting with with Angus on on Twitter, kind of back and forth, and he was like, ah, you know, it's, just put it on your on your business expenses. And yes, of course, this is a business expense for me. Uh, the only thing I'm ever using this thing for is to shoot well podcasts now and and videos. But honestly, I was expecting it to be in in the two and a half to three three thousand euro range because it, it's it's just f1.7 man <laughs> as in the zoom <laughs> lens it's 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 literally as big as a canon what is it the 25 to 70 f 2.8 mm-hmm. which i think is an, is an even more expensive lens and it's yeah the panasonic one is really good um i'm never taking it off of my camera it does <laughs> macro really well it does bokeh really well i've shot mm-hmm. the the raspberry pi 4 review video or ramble video entirely on that lens and it's just it's just it's been fantastic Okay. The only yeah. problem now that I have is that my tripod heads are giving up and they're all kind of too weak to hold it up. So some of them are, <laughs> I, I really need to over tighten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy for you. But you actually have to, de- well, um, deduct it from the taxes for seven years or something like that. Yeah, it's it's German taxes. <laughs> German write offs are crazy because it's write-off. like, I think it counts for like TV production gear or something. Yeah. And that is like forever. Mm. Though, again, I mean, lenses last forever. Um, yeah. but it was 
when I bought my GH5, which is also a almost 2000 bucks just for the body, I was really unhappy when I noticed that I have to ride it off for seven years because, okay, I understand it with lenses, they last for quite a while, but in seven years, we probably have uh, 16K video things. Who knows? Or I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I recently got my taxes done for 18 and now the first bit of 19 and there's a mm, pretty significant chunk of tax payments that I have to uh, to do for those last few years because some of this, mo well, but the money's out of my pocket, right? I've, mm -hmm. I've paid for stuff like cameras and, and computer gear and all that, but the tax deductible is not right there. So I, I basically paid full price right now and then over the next seven years or so, I, I get taxes back because I, I, I still have those things in write-offs. So uh, kind of hurting right now, but it's, <laughs> over the next few years, it'll get evened out. So yeah, uh, you're hopefully not going to starve. No, because I mean, the, the next few years, like I'm, I'm going to be paying less taxes, right? Yeah. Because stuff is still in, in write-offs. Yeah. All right, oh, yeah. so I put one thing in our show notes which has been bugging me for quite a while and it just came up this week again with a colleague of mine who kind of literally told me, yeah, I was watching your podcast thing and I had to turn it off after five minutes because it was just so lame and horrible and boring. <laughs> Okay, that well, that's that's some <sighs> feedback. Okay, and I was really pissed about that. <laughs> um, so what I have put into the comments, and as I said, this has been coming up um, from time to time again. What is a post podcast? How should it actually be um, consumed? And is YouTube the right platform for it? So we are putting the podcast on YouTube because this is the platform that has quite a lot of reach for us yeah but and it's 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 our home right we, we do everything else on youtube yeah and yeah but the thing is a podcast is not a scripted video it's one and a half hours two guys talking about things yeah, just they haven't the scripted shit, out you know as as people say yeah so i don't expect people sitting in front of their phone pc or something like that and just yeah. look at us for one and a half hours sitting there not even taking well not even well like watching yeah, or taking a look into the camera yeah if you've got your youtube tab in the foreground if you're actually watching us you're doing it wrong <laughs> yeah so it is youtube is a platform i think for us to reach a lot of people and to kind of get the word out but if you are serious with podcasts put it on your phone and listen to it while cleaning the house while driving to work while anything else where you do something else while walking outside or things like these yeah. but don't sit in front of your pc and <laughs> take a look at us talking about things yeah. this is not the way podcasts should be consumed and this is also the reason why we usually well don't properly edit the video so we are not putting an, any additional oh, content in there images oh. and things like these um, and i'm kind of hesitant to put well markers into the podcast that people can get to certain topics i kind of understand that but since things are not scripted out and a podcast episode is still one 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 creation that kind of belongs together i would not like to split it up in in certain topics because there have been things probably been discussed before and afterwards and things like these and people shouldn't feel that this is well made perfectly like our videos where we do the research where we do the scripting where we do proper editing and things like these but yeah. i don't know what, what's your opinion on yeah. that but but as, as you were saying that that was exactly what we set out with uh, for the podcast the podcast should be like the other approach to making content videos always like super well prepared i think both of us do that super well prepared scripted most of the time researched all that and the podcast is just us getting together and talking about stuff uh that we care about and that 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 entire part of not really editing it and not polishing it up uh, to a point where it's where it's as good as a video that was that is very intentional uh just so that we can keep doing the podcast and not have it take you know two days to edit to to polish it up to mm. to be like this magnificent no no yeah. it's it's just it's just us two getting together and 
Yeah, I, I see that point. YouTube may not be the perfect platform for that. It's, I mean, you, Stefan, you don't listen to, to a ton of podcasts, as I understand it. Um, I, I do usually whenever I'm, I'm working on stuff or, you know, as you said, cleaning the house, driving, uh, driving somewhere, I usually have a, a podcast on. My pocket cast is full of... Actually, I can, I can show you guys. <laughs> Here we go for, for YouTube. There, there's the one <laughs> advantage of uh, watching us on YouTube. That's, that's kind of a lot. That's my, my podcast subscription. Okay. I don't listen to all of them, but many of them. And it's just it's just background noise, basically. You, you have someone talking about stuff you're interested in. Um, and yeah, this is the, the way I'm listening and, and consuming podcasts is kind of my benchmark for what this podcast should be and where it should fit in. And I think mm. we're, we're doing pretty well with that. Yeah. Now the since you're bringing it up, the the one fear I have with us public publishing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, I don't know where else, Google Podcast, and YouTube is: Are we spreading our podcast too thin? Uh, because of what, what I'm seeing, I've not looked at the numbers of people actually listening to the MP3, which goes through mm. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. Um, I've only looked at the numbers on YouTube, and it's been like you know three and a half to five, six thousand views per episode. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Just on on YouTube. What if what if we took off the YouTube part and actually sent those people to actually listen to the audio version? Would that push us further up in the rankings because more people are listening to the audio versions on Spotify, etc.? Wouldn't that be a, a better thing for us? Maybe, but maybe this is like the entry drug into listening to the podcast. You kind of browse through YouTube, you stumble upon these two people talking about 3D printing related stuff. And Sometimes, then yeah. you yeah, you, you search for them in your podcast player and listen to them like it's supposed to be done. And well, if, if you are a subscriber of YouTube Premium, you can watch or listen to videos when your screen is turned off. Yeah, so on, that on your is... Phone. Sorry? On your on, phone. On your phone, yeah. So that is something which I can do. And I listen to a couple of things that way. For example, the, uh, how's it called from Linus Tech Tips? The... WAN Show. The WAN Show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because, yeah, it's a convenient way, but not everybody has a YouTube Premium subscription. But for those people, they can just download the podcast from uh yeah in their usual podcast player it's it's totally free we are kind of earning nothing from that podcast some a little bit of youtube revenue over the last year but it's... yeah and a few affiliate sales and that but it's it's not yeah we, we're actually we guys let us know in the, in the comments or tweet at us should we start taking sponsors because i've, I've been looking at uh for example anchor that Mm. Uh, Casey Neistat has been recommending, which is a it looks like a really convenient way to to integrate sponsors into these episodes. I want to look into whether that actually makes financial sense, or, or whether it's just you know fifty bucks per episode, because then it's like who cares? I'm not going to go through that effort. <laughs> um, so let us let us know if you do like a, a hey, let's break for our sponsor right now thing in, in the in the podcast. You can always skip through those, by the way. Most <laughs> podcast players have like a, a quick forward uh, button. Yeah. Yeah, um, we could we also should... just well remove the video and just put a black screen on on there, which also some others do. For example, I listen. I I really like to listen to the Hello Internet podcast with Brady Heron and CGP Gray, and right. they are just putting up kind of a black screen with maybe an um, how do you say uh, if you if you visual visualize audio and. How, which the, you had in Winamp. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not visualizer. Not really. Yeah, I'm just missing the word at the moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, CGP Grey doesn't have doesn't really have a, a face on his videos no. anyway. So, no. like, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think what we should be doing is just have, like, a, a small lower third pop-up um, after the, uh, the, the molten iron thing intro runs just to, to have it like, oh, by the way, you should be listening to us on Spotify, Apple, I, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, and all, all those platforms, not on YouTube, I guess. Might be 90? Yeah. Just to, just, try just to, to emphasize that point, right? Yeah, you're right. So if you guys are still watching us on YouTube, <laughs> Stop take out now. your phone, uh, download <sighs> any podcast app and uh, yeah, give it a try that way. Absolutely. You won't regret it. 
All right. So that's the, this is a podcast, not a scripted video topic. <laughs> Next topic. Um, we're not going to be putting markers into these. Yes, I, we, we hear you guys. Markers would be nice. But again, based on w the way I listen to podcasts, I know some podcasts have markers, like uh, Methodish Incorrect has them, mm -hmm. I think. But I never use them. I, I only mm. skip forward and backwards, like the, the standard uh, pocket cast, I think 10 and 30 seconds that you can skip. And that's mm. all I use. I never skip topics because if I'm listening to the podcast, like I usually want to listen to the whole thing. I actually try to implement those markers into the MP3, but it's really hard to do. Um, there are some Python scripts which didn't work for me. And there is, I think, only one app that works on macOS, which I don't have. Hmm. Um, where you can put them in, so I just left it as it is. It it, it might be that um, the uh, what's the what's the software called? The one that you can podcast remotely with. Uh, that's based on Reaper. Uh, I I think I've mentioned that to you before, but that there's hmm. a software that that is intentionally or or modifying Reaper, which is a, an audio production suite, yeah. um, to do remote podcast recording. And I think if any software can do it, then that should be able to do hmm. it. Um, yep. But again, Reaper is a commercial software. I think it's like 150 bucks or something. Yep. Um, the mod on top of that is free, but I, I don't. I don't see the need to put m even more effort into the into the podcast. <laughs> All right, uh, as as you by the way can can tell by the by the logo how much effort it's been going into that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right, STL inaccuracy in large assemblies. This is something that did you note it down? And I'm like how what <laughs> so please please let me know what, what's what's been going on and what what have you been seeing with stls okay so i stumbled upon a problem with stls um just this week and i have never read about that so far and this is maybe something that a lot of us will really stumble upon, but I think it's still worth mentioning. So the thing is, um, if you are a company and you're not producing a single part, but like an assembly of parts or a crane or an excavator or, I don't know, an airplane, um, you have an assembly of parts and sometimes sub-assemblies of this big part are not created in the origin of the coordinate system, but at their specific locations, sometimes 50 meters away from the origin. Right. And S the, the company you're working with does deal with those larger assemblies. Yeah. So Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Um, so the thing is, sometimes models can be defined not at the origin of the coordinate system, uh, but the uh, real origin of the global coordinate system is far, far away from your local coordinate system where you do your sketches and stuff. And so I got a part to 3D print and I was trying to align it in Cura that it was perpendicular. What's, it was a really simple part. It was a cylinder and a disc and something like that. So I had big surfaces I could use to align and I wasn't able to do, that, to, to do it. All of the times, one of the surfaces just wasn't perpendicular to the rest. But they, they should have been. They should have been. I, okay. I rechecked the, the CAD file. In the CAD file, everything was fine. Then I thought about, okay, maybe we have something in, implemented that kind of does a uh, a protection thing if you export an STL. <laughs> uh, some random numbers uh, are, are put in there that you don't have the exact representation of a part in the end. Uh, but yeah, that also wasn't the case. So then I have taken a look at the model again. And interestingly, the STL was saved as a um, as an ASCII file and not as a um, binary, binary STL. The other one, yeah. So you can directly take a look at the locations of the vertices and the locations of the triangles in the part. And the interesting thing is that STLs only use like six significant digits for coordinates. That is not a lot. <laughs> that is not a lot. And that leads to the point that if you have a part that is defined 50 meters from the origin or let's say 100 meters from the origin, 
um, you cannot um, you cannot distinguish or you can only distinguish one tenth of a millimeter. Yeah. So you will get an aliasing effect. So this is just a round of error that happens there. And if a a part is not flat to one of the coordinate axes, all of the points can only will always be so you don't have a nice transition. Um, they will always be in one direction, like yeah, this this ten millimeter space, and you don't get uh, flat surfaces again, uh, yeah. flat surfaces anymore. I mean, as soon as you have like tilted surfaces in in STLs, they're never exactly never uh, but flat. Or, or in most, or yeah. in some cases they can be, but in most in most cases they are not because yeah. it's it's always triangles, and those yeah. are always on discrete yeah. uh, points. But just as as you move further yeah. away from from the center, those discrete points become coarser and co aligned to a much coarser grid. Exactly. So I've I've been trying to Google while you were talking about this because I, I had a hunch of of where this was going. Um, whether STLs actually have a, a limit for resolution, because what what do you actually what this sounds like is is we have like a float number, but it's not a thirty two bit or how many bit float, um, but just like a, a four bit, well, a bit more than that, probably an eight bit float or something. Um, now, hold on, that, that would, that would, whatever. <laughs> 16 bits, probably, somewhere in that range. Um, and, and basically with a float number, you have a, a fixed number of significant digits and you're just moving the comma yeah. um, or the, the decimal point. Um, so, but but that's I, I don't think that's an inherent issue with the STL format because if you look at some uh, some STL exports I've, I've seen some that have like you know twenty twenty five significant mm -hmm. significant digits that may just be an issue of uh, the export in may the software that you're doing. It was maybe an issue of the sef software that we are using, but I also tried it the other way around. I exported a step file, which you can also take a look at because it's ASCII and there the coordinates are saved with like 16 digits or something like that. And if I imported that into the software that we use for preparing our parts, which is a horribly expensive, well, which is Materialized Magics, which is a horribly expensive software to work on STLs. And there I had the same issue. So internally with their STL translator that they were using or that, that they are using to translate a a CAD file to an SDL file, the same thing was happening. And what I did then, I was moving the part to the origin of the coordinate system again and everything was fine again. As I said, this is not something which will be a problem for most of us, but this is just a, an inherent problem of, yeah, of, of the STL file as I have seen it, if you save it with not enough digits. Yeah, a uh, correction of what I just said about not being an inherent issue of the STL file. It is an inherent issue of the STL file because each of the coordinates are a 32-bit float value. Um, so, by the way, also the the amount or the number of triangles you can have in a in a 30 in a uh, in an STL file is also stored as a an int uh, as a 32-bit integer so you have a, a, an absolute limit of how many triangles you can have in there and you can also only have 32 bits of information per uh, per triangle so yes that is an issue with stl that is fascinating yeah it was it was really interesting for me to find that out because as i said i haven't read about that before and i didn't think that this would be an issue, but if you are in a in an industry where designs are made in that way, and as I said, if you are making big assemblies, if you're making I don't know, well, airplanes or cars or well, for cars they're a little bit smaller, but still, at some <laughs> point, at, at some point you will get to the point where things are get well, where the round of error is getting worse and worse, and. Mm -hmm. It it just depends on on what sort of of uh, precision you need um, exactly. with your your files. Uh, I mean, you're saying okay with a car, it may not be may not be that bad. But if you, for example, have your your engine block in your car, and typically I think where, where's the center point for cars? Is it? I forgot. I knew at some point where where the, <laughs> where the cat center point for cars is usually. But um, if you have your engine block and you have like a valve stem that is ever so slightly misaligned or, or some other precision part, you have your camshaft that is just slightly off. I don't know. Yeah. The, 
you you're getting the same sort of issues. So yeah. it's something that you should keep in mind with STOs, yeah. Yeah. Um and at that point we have seen that on our FDM prints because just the day before my 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 intern was printing the part and he already said okay he couldn't perfectly align it and you could see a step in the print uh but if you're using another technology like SLA printing where the layers are way finer you might already see issues and misaligned layers uh way o- earlier even if the parts are maybe only 5 meters away from the uh the origin just yeah. I, I just wanted to put that out because I don't know if people are really aware of that. And this is just another point why at some point it might be a good thing to get away from the STL file and use something else. Well, for what, what, what alternatives do we have? Well, yeah. we <laughs> as alternatives, we do have things like step files and IGES files and things like these. But well, the problem yeah. is... Uh, with the geometrical definition of surfaces, it's not that easy to do the slicing as with just like cut a triangle with a plane. It's really simple to find out where the intersection line is. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why we're still using STLs. And even in CAM programming, lots of three-dimensional CAM programming is not done on the real mathematically defined surface but the part is translated into an sdl file and then the generation of the tool paths is uh is 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 then generated on the stl file and not not the real part yeah um that may just be an issue of you know at some point your computer is not going to be able to handle like such a fine resolution of so many so many because essentially the cam or cnc machines also run on discrete points and 3d yep. printers as well if you're really generating a point for every i don't know every micron along a curve <laughs> it's just not going to happen so it, at some point they do simplify as well yeah yeah so uh, the if uh, yeah it, it's really going to be step right um step format is, is the only one that can do real accurate geometry because if you look at opt uh, the wavefront object it's it's basically stl it's the same format yeah uh and it's i don't cool. know um how it is with 3mf 3mf is just a container it's, it's, it's just essentially a, con- a zip yeah. file with uh one or more stls in there so it's yeah. the same thing again um though 3mf may be able to contain other things than, than stls yeah yeah i don't know there, there are some things happening in the industry where people want to get away from the STL file, especially if you, for example, think about lattice structures, because saving lattice structures as an STL file just blows up yeah. everything. So if I'm talking about l- lattice structure, for for the listeners, these are the small beam and bar elements. For example, if you have a, f- a foam or something like that, yeah. If you want to print that out, something like you, a, like an infill structure, in a 3D like an infill structure. If yeah. you discreetly save that as an STL, all of the small walls and beams and things like these, your STL files gonna be huge, and this is a real problem. So people are thinking about just defining a space where then um, this pattern will be, for example, put in during the slicing process. Yeah. And this can and, be done with 3MF and things like these, I think, because um, something like you have an XML file or any markup language in there where you can assign certain things to yeah, certain, but it's, certain it's, other it's things. It's not part of the actual 3MF right now, I think, right? It's, it's not, no. That, that's it's something not. that's possible because 3MF is just a container and you can put yeah. you know all sorts of things in there. For example, I think uh, Mikolaj from Prusa just recently posted that, oh, you can, by the way, change uh, or create a thumbnail for your 3MF files by putting a, a PNG file in there and then creating mm-hmm. a small XML file yeah. that just says, thumbnail is this file in this container. So yeah. there's a lot more possible. Ultimaker's sure. already doing that, um, even though they're not using... 3mf files but if you have the new ultimaker s5 you don't just put a g-code file on the machine you also have a container that uh, contains a a thumbnail of the print and other information and is also zipped that uh, the file size is smaller yeah i've been i've been seeing uh, the same thing with the thumbnail on the illegal mars too um, okay. where you have your 
peel b b blah 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 uh the it's it's the any cubic photon file format by the way um and that ha also has a thumbnail but i've not been able to open it with 7-zip so it's some proprietary archive there are tools to load and or, or read and write those but it's mm. it seems to be a bit of a, of a proprietary format but also does that yeah yeah so just stl not, not a great format right yeah, not a great format. So if you are in any industry where things like these could happen, take a look uh, in which coordinate system you are writing out your STL files. Yeah. All right. Right. Um, so your last two videos were performing really well. Yes. Um, let me let me span a bridge between what we okay. were just talking about with the with the lattice structures because that that's okay. still on on my mind. Um, you said lattice structures take up a ton of space as soon as you put them into a mesh, um, yep. as soon as you want to define or describe them with a mesh, which is also the same reason why you can't really simulate 3D prints with infills yet, because if you if you have a full infill structure in a uh, in a finite element analysis, it's just a huge data set that you, that you have to turn through. So on the topology optimization video, people were asking, asking hey, can you can you like actually simulate that? And, and does it make sense to, to simulate that before you print it uh, versus printing it and then just destroying it? And I was always like, well, I mean, I could do it, but it's still a 3D print and it has layer adhesion versus inter intra layer strength. And it also has infill and it's just, do, do, do you know of any good simulation software? That's, well, uh, you probably know one that's that's gonna be like 35,000 euros, but. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Hyperworks, Hyperworks, OptiStruct, they have a topology, of, well, it's kind of very well known for their topology optimization. And they have a lattice structure tool in their topology optimization suite. So um, what you did when you did topology optimization and you were dragging the slider for density, yeah, tell me about all the things that, that I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so the topology optimization in the end will usually not tell you at a point have material or have no material. So it will tell you have 70% of material right there. Have so it will tell you a density. A density a density distribution is sorry. A density distribution is the thing you're getting out of a topology yeah. optimization. And and you were using that for like the smart infill, <coughs> which is basically Ex exactly what yeah. that's supposed to be used for, right? <coughs> exactly. So um, with the internal algorithms, the topology optimization algorithm is trimmed in a way that um, it tries to converge in a way that most of the parts are either density zero or density 100%. But there will still be that gradient in between. And what, for example, OptiStruct can do is take the gradient regions and put lattice structure in there. And right. then um, size the beams of that lattice structure according to the density the topology optimization put out. I think I've seen a, a talk about that on uh, on uh, Fabcon this year. Yeah, could could be the case. To be <sighs> honest, it does sound um, familiar. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of lattice <laughs> structure. I don't see a proper application for lattice structure. To be honest, because <sighs> well, for for external stuff, right? Also for, for internal stuff. Second, also for internal stuff. Also, if you if you want to if you want to make a real lightweight. If you w want to make a really lightweight and efficiently lightweight structure, uh, lattice structure is rarely the proper method to get a part light because it's usually better to either put no material or full material at a location and put the material at a position where it can be efficiently used. Because the thing with lattice structure is, for example, if you have a lattice structure which is shaped like an X, um, it will be, it will not have, or let me put it another way. Um, for lattice structure, the ratio between strength and the material ratio is not, um, eh, just, just give me one second. Uh, I'm missing the word, uh, pro proportional anymore. So 
the density of a letter structure, so a, a, a letter structure with 50% density is not as, is not 50% as strong as, how, oh, how can I phrase yeah, that the proper I, way? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. If, so. if, I ha if I have a part that is, if I have a part that is 50% ladder structure, it is not as strong as, as if I would have 50, if, as if I would have put 50% material there, because only if I align the ladder structure directly in the direction of the force, it is used, used efficiently. And as soon as some of the ladder structure is not aligned to like the flux of force to your part, it's getting inefficient. So there are rarely any cases where ladder structure can be properly used. <laughs> what about, zooming out here real quick, what about stiffness though? Um, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Exactly okay. the same. Um, example, that uh, just, just help me understand this. I'm sitting at an IKEA table right now. Yep. I can actually tilt down your camera. This, this is the standard yep. IKEA desk table that is six euros 99. Um, and it's the same structure that basically every IKEA piece of furniture is built with. So it's a thin sheet of uh, high density fiber or something with a, with a coating, with a polymer coating, and then your cardboard uh, honeycomb in the center. Yep. So this stuff is extremely light, extremely rigid, um, and extremely strong. So I, if, if we were just to use the same material in like a flat sheet, it would be like a floppy something, something. It would just yeah. be a flat sheet of floppy material. So how how is this a, a worse solution than <laughs> yeah, you mean a solid part? I, I don't see how this would work with, with a non lattice <laughs> structure. <laughs> yeah, the thing is um, you can use lattice structure as a support structure. So the thing is, the really, um, the really sparse foam core that you have in your table is not really taking any mechanical loads. The thing that is taking mechanical loads is the upper and lower um, surface of the part, because usually your table is loaded in bending. Yeah, it's just the, the typical, you know, beam loading. Yeah. You know, top and bottom have the loads and center has nothing. And the structure in between, so in the sandwich, it's only acting more or less as a support structure to take a bit of the shear forces that are happening if um, if a part is is bent. But the main loads are taken by the upper and lower surface. Um, it's it's really hard to to get your head around that with such an example there and for something like this there are applications even if you're taking t uh, talking about composites where kind of letter structure or or foams are worth having but that's usually for support structures they're not really good in taking loads so essentially essentially saying the um I'm 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 thinking one step further into yeah. like thin walled uh, tubes, bike frames, all that. Yeah. Um, those are like mountain bike frames. They have really yeah. thick, thin walled aluminum tubes, um, which are strong, uh, stiff, rigid, all yeah. all the good things you want. But they are uh, sensible to like just getting dense and buckling. also to, to buckling at at a yeah. certain point. So you're saying the something like a, a an infill lattice structure will help with those kind of corner cases, mm -hmm. um, but it won't actually increase like the design function of the part. It won't, it won't significantly yeah. increase the efficiency of the structure. So with like then 10, if you have an infill of 10%, it usually doesn't give you 10% more stiffness and more uh, strength. This is the thing. There are rare cases or not really rare cases, but most of the cases, the infill is used as support structure. There are cases where you have, um, where only pressure is, a, is applied to the outer walls. Their ladder structure has its applications. But as I said, most of the time, if you're putting in like 20% infill, you won't get 20% more strength. Yep. But if you can, so, if you can use the structure, for example, to prevent buckling, this is something different. But buckling is not a strength problem. Buckling is a stability problem, and there are some kind of other rule of, rules apply. So, so when it when it comes to three D printing, essentially what what I what I see you saying here is uh, use 
thicker shells instead of more infill, which which I agree with, which totally makes sense. Yes. Um, to a point, right, where we have you, you need to support your top surfaces somehow. Exactly. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, well, what do you think about gradual infill then where you have um your shell on the outside say four perimeters mm -hmm. and then you have a, a you know a five millimeter area of say 25 percent infill and then step it down to 10 mm -hmm. and five percent towards the uh towards the core which cura does with cubic something cura something has a mode some, that does yeah. it automatically um it can uh it can be beneficial from time to time because if you have a bar in bending, the maximum stresses will be on the upper and lower yep. surface of the part. And then you have a linear gradient between, well, full tension to full compression. So the neutral fiber in the middle, it's not loaded at all. So it's not worth putting any, uh, putting any material there. So gr um, gradual infill will put Mater will put material kind of gradually at the places how much they are then loaded in, in such a load case yeah um, so yeah it does still help with like point loads on the on the surface yes um, it does still support those yeah but as i said this is a stability problem and not a strength problem yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The, uh, the I, thing I, I I follow you. I, I do I do see your point. <laughs> so I might I might not be a hundred percent right in any aspect, but this is how I understood it over the last years. Um, gradual infill also kind of nice if you have like a really really sparse infill at if if you want to make an aesthetic part which has big overhanging areas, gradual infill helps you with just having the core totally hollow and then starting to gradually build up support yeah. structure that you can nicely print uh, top surfaces. Yeah, and it, uh, gradual infill works really well with cubic because cubic just has that inherent, or the, the way Cura does it, where it mm. has those cubic cells yeah. and it just doesn't subdivide some of those. Um, yeah. The further it goes towards the inside, it just leaves out the full yeah. subdivision, but the walls of that cube are still built. Mm -hmm. um, one one last one last question for you on the, on, the, on that point. Um, so you're not a fan of lettuces, but here's the thing: with uh, efficient structures, often come down to having tube shapes um, because of, of torsional stiffness and all of that. Uh, the no lattice rule only applies when you can make those 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 tubes, right? Yes. If you have just the this the structure that I made, well, which is essentially smaller tubes but if, yeah. you, if you just have like a, a small finger structure yeah. um or individual well yeah i mean that would be about kind, random, kind right? of the thing you printed was already a, a lettuce structure in a way because yeah. you had all of these small arms yeah it was a it was a large scale and a small scale lettuce yeah. structure if you take a look at nature, if you take a look at bamboo, for example, why is bamboo hollow? Yeah. Because you need the material on the outside because rarely your load cases are pure tension or pure compression. You always have bending loads or torsional loads. And for these load cases, the maximum stresses will be on the outer surfaces. So at these locations, the material is used, is used the most efficient way. Um, but again, if you have stability problems and you can prevent buckling, for example, with an infill structure, then it's increasing the stiffness, but in another way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, makes sense. I'm, I'm, <laughs> we've probably lost about sixty percent of our listeners and viewers at this point, but uh, it, it was really technical. But I think it's an interesting thing because this is also a kind of a hype topic which had been coming up over the last years with three D printing. Yeah, we can do infill structure right now, but nobody, nobody, nobody ever could show me a proper <laughs> application besides heat exchangers and some other rare applications where lattice structure is really useful. And if you have a real part which is outside doing something and you have visible lattice structure, it will get all dirty and grimed and blah, yeah, stuff like that's, that. That's so, just the, mm. the, the meta problem. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so so to sum things up, uh, use more shells and less infill. Yes, and watch my video about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, you, you did cover that. I did Absolutely. cover that one and a half years ago, something like that. I'm, 
that was exactly because of that because i always read uh, i want to make my part really strong let's make 100 infill yay yeah. no that It's not how you should do it efficiently. Yeah, it might be stronger than just using four perimeters, but it will print way longer. It will use more material. And yeah. I'm 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 a narrow space engineer. I always look for lightweight structures, and this is also the efficiency using the least amount of material for the most amount of strength. And this is where I'm coming from. If you're building excavators or something like that. Weight You're still not might using not always be an issue. So yeah. having more weight might even be beneficial from time to time. And then it's not, yeah, then put 100% infill in everything because, yeah, you can. But yeah, in lots of applications, it is just not really efficient. Yeah. So, yeah, slicer manufacturers, if you're listening, um, I think gradual infill can be like a really good step in the right direction. Um, there are also modes mm. in... Akira also has the, the the feature that it can support just your top surfaces. Mm. Um, like if you move X amount down, then it has the infill density. Mm. But if we had something that really does it in a 3D space, mm. I think that would be really neat. Mm. That would be a real good step in the right direction. Yeah, if you guys are using Cura, it's really interesting to take a look at the experimental experimental features from time to time, because um, Ultimaker is actually including lots of like suggestions from the community and people that have well programmed something for their own and then put it on github into the normal release of cura and you can activate these things um under the experimental tab it's wire printing and make structure 3d printable which kind of if you have an overhang it makes a 45 degree angle on yeah it. there are really cool things in there which you should check out from time to time. Yeah, there is uh, definitely lots of good stuff going on there. Yep. Cool. Should we should we move on? Should we yeah. move on? That, that that topic took unexpectedly long, but good stuff, man. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess we'll just skip over Pi four and the top of well, topology optimization stuff. Uh, we've covered that. Cool. Yeah. News. One really sad Fif news. Fifty five minutes in, we were starting with the news section. Yeah. Uh, Grant Thompson, the king of random, died in a paragliding accident. Paramotoring, actually. Param paramotoring, yes. Yeah. So. so, yeah, just a week ago, I was I was ugh, getting goosebumps again at the moment. Uh, it was really hard to read that, that he had died, because he is, is he the biggest, like, tech YouTuber out there? Or at least one of the biggest, um... Yeah, well, he he built up his channel over the years and got really, really big. And just like a year ago or one and a half years ago, he started passing off his like work in front of the camera to the to other guys yeah. and tried to use his time more for his family. Yeah, um, he was an airplane, uh, not airplane, an airline pilot pilot. And he was obviously into flying things, and yeah, just a week ago he died in a paramotor accident, which is which is really sad. Yeah. Um, so from from my point of view, I've I mean I've, I've watched some of the the King of Random videos. I've not watched too many of them simply because I, I the style of video is not the yeah. style of video I usually watch. But here's the thing. Um, Grant Thompson and, and that entire channel has been a, a, a real kind of a, a real good example of how to run a YouTube channel and of how to, to grow one and also that those the, all those steps of okay I want to get away from the, the the grunt work the the grind work of you know putting out all these videos by myself um, just running it as a business for for him I think that's a that's something that we can definitely learn from mm. uh, from him and how he did things. Yeah, it's it, sad. It also makes you think because I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, Grant is is a bit of a of a bigger YouTuber, blah, 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 but how old was he? Thirty eight, something like that. Yeah, he he was born, I think, nineteen eighty. Yeah, so uh, roughly thirty eight, thirty nine. Yeah, <sighs> and he's leaving four or five kids. That's kind of sad. Yeah. And a wife. Life is short, man. Yeah. 
use it to your fullest extent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not going paramotoring, but I am on the road pretty often. That's one of the deadliest places <clears throat> out there. At least you're not motorcycling. Uh, yeah, but... But here's the thing, though. I mean, the, I, I he died doing something that he loved. Mm. Uh, I, I believe so. He wouldn't be doing it, right? He, he wouldn't be going out paramotoring. Um <laughs> Is is it really the right thing to say, to now say? Oh, I'm never getting on an airplane again. I'm not going to see Japan because I it may just for the record, airplanes are one of the safest means of transportation these days. But I'm not doing anything risky anymore because uh, uh, that's not the right thing to do, right? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. No. Well, do the things you like. Do the things you enjoy. Um, maybe don't do the things which are really really dangerous but he he probably would have missed out on something if he wouldn't have done it yeah so yeah it's 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 sad um i think the community will miss him uh i'm kind of interested to see how the well channel will change without him not being there anymore they said that they're gonna continue um producing videos so for the last couple of days i think they were mostly memorial videos but at some yeah. point they they <laughs> think they're gonna get back to the normal content but i think it's it's kind of hard especially in the beginning because you have all this legacy <laughs> from him in there and yeah also these and the, the, the two, the two guys that are doing it they it's, are it's probably not the right thing to just go out there and say oh yeah we're we're, we're doing the regular content we're doing all hypey happy stuff uh, i think doing a bit of a taking a month break or something and then coming back with mm. with solid content that can be something that and it's probably going to be the thing they do yeah um and it's the reasonable thing to do but I think it, it it would also if if, if that was me, mm. I, and if I had a team behind me, I would I would like them to do the same thing and keep mm. the keep the spirit alive. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. We missed. So I'll be still going to Japan. <laughs> yeah, please do. Hopefully there won't be an earthquake, tsunami, or whatever. <laughs> that's probably the, so, the, the well, most dangerous thing about being in in japan right um and just these days we've also had a bit of a shock moment on our channels um, oh yes <laughs> on our own channels um everyone's been having that so apparently youtube has been misreporting views for youtube creators not on the on the view counter on videos but in youtube studio there's just been a drop of for me, more than 50% of views. And I was mm. like, just, it's over. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Uh, but apparently that's that's been, it's being worked on and it's just a reporting issue. And props to YouTube for being relatively good with the communication this time. They've, you know, YouTube has not been great with communicating these things to creators. But if anyone opens up the YouTube studio right now, there's a big message right there. Oh, by the way, from August 7th, we've been seeing some reporting issues that there's been a misreporting in, in view counts. And, no. you know, two years ago, <coughs> that, that wouldn't have been a thing. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I was all, also really, really struck because the last three or four weeks were really good for views on my channel. And then I just, I've been taking, taking a look at my view counter in the morning and I just saw a kind of sudden drop by yeah 50% of my views and I thought okay so the good times are over you should probably get back to producing more content uh, but I was kind of happy to see that also great Scott had the same issue and then I talked to you and you had the same issue as well I mean and happy to see is, is <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah, so I, I was really thinking about if I should release my um, latest video tonight because I did not know if it will underperform. It has um, a sponsorship in there uh, and the sponsors, they will take a look at the views. And if something is wrong with the view counter, they say it's not the external view counter, but yeah, you never know. Um, this might be an expensive incident for me. Yeah. 
but let's hope they get it fixed. Um, and apparently, it's not it's not a real performance issue. But because I mean, if it's affecting everyone, like where are the views going to go? <laughs> like, yeah. People are still spending time <laughs> I, on YouTube. I, I thought about that. Yeah, maybe <laughs> I don't know. Beauty channels are getting fifty percent more views <laughs> since two days ago. Extremely weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All oh, right, well. but yeah, um, your channel has been doing really well. Mine has been as well. Now that I've I've kind of had the time to produce videos again, mm. so I've been getting everything else sorted. Yeah. Um, uh, topology optimization is still like alive and kicking. Well, I'm, it doesn't make sense to pull up analytics yeah. now because it's it's, it's going to be wrong. How many views do you actually have on that video so far? I think over three hundred thousand now, that's, at least. Oh, almost four hundred thousand. Four. Almost four hundred thousand. Okay. And that's really good in two weeks. Uh, it's been my best performing video ever. For sure. I mean, by 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 a good stretch. Yeah, and that's that's motivating. I already said that in in the beginning. But uh, even though we enjoy what we are doing, it's still nice, at least from time to time, to get a video which gets lots of traction. Because uh, it, it, at least for me, it's rewarding to see that the work you have put into something, uh, people seem to enjoy it, or at least the algorithm seems to enjoy it. Yeah, uh, for for me, it's 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 just good having that one like punch of a video um, yeah. right after I got ba back from what feels to me like a bit of a a low spot, uh, you know, not not really producing that much, and and what I didn't feel like was really solid content, but more like you mm. know okay content. Um, but the thing is, the is is that video actually going to have a, a long term? result or, or is, is it still going to be relevant in, in half a year because what the, the content that i think I, I enjoy most is just having solid guides like about the tmc mm -hmm. 2209 that have just come out uh new, the new more powerful dynamic drivers how to use those or how to set up octoprint or how to configure marlin those those like slow burner they're still going to be relevant in two year kind of videos um it makes me happy seeing that those are still doing so well after such a long time and i don't think the <laughs> top optimization video is going to do that well you always distinguish your content between like the normal videos that are more or less news or relevant at the moment and the, the kind of evergreens and at least i think this is with the topology optimization and the process you're showing something that is still relevant in like a year or something like that so if i'm taking a look at my analytics at the moment and my best performing video is the recycle your failed 3d print diy yep. extruder thing at the moment it was blowing up at some point but still i get almost four to five thousand views every day from only that single video it hasn't That's dropped for ages so this is kind of nice because this is just keeping um this is just keeping the 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 the, the views on the channel uh, channel at a keeping more the steady level, relevant, right? Yeah. yeah. By the way, I've, I've been saving up uh, old PLA prints. I've got like three kilos by now. Yeah. <laughs> I I was really to. thinking about so we're gonna maybe talk about my the the Cetus three D printer for for a second. So I already printed four more benches on there, and I think at some point we should make a video making new filament out of. 3D benches. <laughs> yeah, just have. I, I I think I have like an entire bucket full of 3D benches yeah. just from a Philween series. Yeah, me too. I'd have to sort them into what is actually PLA and what is like mm. other stuff, but yeah, should be doable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, the so yeah the the, the long term relevancy of, of that video and also how technical it was because I, I think I left out a, a few of the like really hardcore technical aspects out of that video. Mm. Um, and kind of unintentionally, like it, I, I just wrote down the script for that and was like, oh, I kind of, um, and it ended up as a, I guess, Facebook shareable video. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I, I also saw it ended up on a, on like a Spanish meme site <laughs> and got like 16,000 views from there. Okay. Uh, so it, it seems to be a really shareable video. Mm. <sighs> uh. Yeah, I, think I, I know. I know it's something that that Joel is really good at making like the share worthy content. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I, I always try to make something that that people learn from. And my home is Twitter. Mm -hmm. My home is not Facebook. 
So, I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, you already talked about that f for, for a little bit um, just a second ago. What can you, can you take from that success? How can you learn from that? How do you change the content in the future that, um, yeah, kind of videos are, are blowing up more, more and more in the future? So what are your takes? Not what are your takes? What have you learned from that experience? Not much, because who's who's going to predict a viral video? I mean, for for me, that that's that video is viral. It's the viral laugh, the viralest I've ever been, I've ever gone. <laughs> um, the thing is, if you if you can predict it, like everyone would be doing it. Yeah. So I don't know. Sometimes it's just the random stuff. Yeah. Um, what I did see though is that um, I, I kind of use Twitter as a, as a gauge of interest at, at points, and people were really liking what I was showing about the topology optimization. So that kind of gave me a hint that yes, this is something to go forward with. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 projects, it's it's stuff like that that is fun for me to build. Mm -hmm. But I still need to make those those evergreens, those those guys, because I think yeah. I'm I'm one of the few channels that actually mm. does that. Mm. Well, it's I think it's really nice to see that even educational videos can get viral and not the latest dumb things, whatever you can find on the trending pages. This is times, still yeah. giving me a bit of hope in humanity. <laughs> <laughs> but you just talked about about Twitter. Um, so the thing is, with my filament extruder and also the threaded inserts, I posted a couple of things on Twitter before that, and they got liked and retweeted and whatever uh, uh, interacted with them way more than my other stuff. And those were also the things which did really uh, good then on YouTube. So I think other social media is kind of a good indicator if. Uh, yeah. projects will be doing well also on YouTube. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's it's way easier to post something on Twitter versus posting something on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, YouTube has an entire community feature where you can post images and, and text stuff and all, but come on, that's just such a lame tacked on feature. I feel like mm. I barely use that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Twitter, I have, I have like 20,000 Twitter followers now, which is about 10% of the subscriber count on YouTube. So it should make up for a decent subset, maybe even a representative subset mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the people that are subscribing on YouTube. Yeah. The, the, the digital dashboard has been getting some, some good traction on Twitter. So that's going to be the video for next week. Yeah. <laughs> and you, and you actually peeled your screen. I was just, oh, yeah. I was watching the video yesterday and I've seen that, You are sitting in front of a a new television where still all of the protective coating was on, and I just thought, how could he? <laughs> What a madman! What a madman! Uh, is he really doing that for protecting his new television? And I thought, ah, I think you're not the guy who are who is keeping protective no, things I can't on. Stand that. Yeah, that, that stuff just gets grimy yeah. and, and ah, nah. <laughs> So I think that was kind of nicely included in the end, just to then peel everything off. So yeah, the, the, really the real well reason done. for that was was actually consistency, which yeah. I still screwed up by by switching back to me in this space again uh, mm. and talking about you know get subscribed and all that. But I, I had filmed the benchmarks the yeah. day before and then just edited them into the the my my voiceover basically, which yeah. it should be obvious from the video. And I was like, okay, if I peel this after I do the test, I'm going to have a peeled TV with me. But as soon as I switch over to benchmarks, mm -hmm. like it's going to be, uh, hmm. should I just peel it right away? Mm. Nah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well done. That was, well that done. was fun. <laughs> All right. That was fun. Um, topic of the week. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm sweaty up here. It is, this is, this is one of the warmest rooms in the house. I have my, my two Synology NASs in here. And they're just pumping out heat. They're off right now, but... Um, <sighs> well, 27 degrees in here, so I'm used to that. You have oh, yeah. AC in your apartment house. <laughs> yes, I do, but it's it's literally on the other end of the thing. So it's if I turn it on over there, it doesn't really do much here. Yeah. Yes, topic of the week. Should silent stepper drivers be state-of-the-art in current-gen 3D printers? Well, should they be the default? I mean, they, they are a state of the art, technically. Yeah. 
So the reason why I put that into our show notes was that I received the Cetus 3D, 3D printer um, a couple of days ago and assembled it yesterday. So for everyone who doesn't know what the Cetus uh, printer is, is that um, really small, tiny and compact printer with all linear rails for all of the access, which is really, really nice. So if you have watched Angus's videos... Yeah, I was going to say that he did make some some videos on that. Yeah, he made um, a couple of videos on the Cetus and I also, well, finally got my hands on one. But I put it together together yesterday, I turned it on and it was so loud and the um, and the metal case it has or the metal structure, it's just yeah used as a resonance body so uh, i'm thinking this is at the moment a 400 us dollar 3d printer and at least which isn't cheap which isn't cheap and some of the money yeah goes into the linear rails um even though they don't use high wind rails anymore but i was asking myself if you make a new revision of that printer and that printer was released at the beginning of this year why are you not putting um, silent stepper drivers in there and the reason why I put that question into into the show notes was maybe you with your background can give me and the listeners a little bit more insight on how much more expensive is a trinamic driver in comparison to um, an A4988 uh, is it more expensive to integrate is it why, why were not why weren't they using a more state-of-the-art driver for their system? Because if they would use that, I think it would be a way better printer because you can just put it somewhere. It's really nice. It's it's a really nice package and really nice format, but the noise is just bugging me. Yeah. It it really is jarring when you know when you're used to silent printers or even relatively quiet printers, like the even behind you have the Prusa Mark 2, two point something, five. which you 2.5, yeah, uh, which has the, the Allegro driver still in, right? Yeah. doesn't have trinamic drivers. Nope. So that's not, I mean, it, that, that's a normal volume printer. Would you say that the uh, Cetus is louder or quieter than that? Um, it's similarly loud, but I okay. don't know that the noise is a little bit different because you have this metal rattling sound of the structure all of the time. Um, right. which is a little bit higher pitch than the noise you're getting from the Prusa printer because um, the things that are rattling there are bigger and a little bit more sloppy, so the resonance frequency is and lower. And it's still using uh, polymer 3D printed parts, um, yeah. which which naturally kind of dampen yeah. uh, vibrations like that. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, should silent separate drivers be the state of the art or should they be default? And And I would say, yeah, sure. Yes, definitely. Now, with with every driver out there, you do need to to put a bit of time into matching drivers to motors to get like the optimal result. If you just take some motor which has the wrong inductance uh, and pair it with the wrong stepper driver, like different stepper drivers prefer different types of motors. Um, and actually, the Allegro drivers versus the, the Texas Instruments drivers prefer the exact opposite uh, type of motor, high inductance versus low inductance, if I can remember which is which, but... I don't know. Doesn't matter. Um, they should motors should be matched to drivers. And what the what for example the Prusa Mark do, Mark Three is doing is they've they've specifically um, worked with who is it that the uh, that's yeah. making the motors that Chinese, those guys yeah those guys yeah uh, they, they've worked with them to to really select the the perfect match there. So they they're you know in solid mode. It's solid. Um, but even if you don't do that, even if you just take a trinamic driver and and sl- slap it into a printer that you know has random motors in there that used to use Allegro drivers or something, the trinamics are still going to be quieter. They're still going to be better um, than the uh, than Allegro or TI or well, actually, actually, there, there's there's like one. If if you're worried about costs, there is that one Chinese cloned trinamic that kind of uses mm-hmm. a similar control loop. Which is not as good, but it's it's kind of getting you there. I don't know how much those cost, but I'm sure they're in line with what the Allegro's cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is, like, separate drivers, if you buy them in bulk, if you have, like, a custom PCB, or even if you have a pre-made PCB that uses those drivers, mm-hmm. those components don't really make up that much in cost. Like, okay. mechanical parts are going to be way more expensive. 
um, simply because weight and shipping and all mm. that factors into that and a small IC in the grand scheme of things is kind of negligible. Mm. Uh, so yeah, especially now that, so if the, the, the kind of argument would have been, uh, oh yeah, the, the dynamic drivers, especially the small ones, um, can't push that much current or mm. 1.2 amps or whatever. But realistically, that's the sort of current that you would be using with, especially with an Allegro driver as well. Those do like to overheat if you if you push too much. Mm. Um, and that's like the typical currents that you run them at. And even at, at comparable currents, I don't know if I, if I measured wrong, but even at comparable currents, I found that the Trinamic drivers are more reliable and don't uh, lose steps when you get stuff like resonances or, or hard shocks, hard accelerations. Mm. They don't lose steps as easily as the other drivers. So, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see a reason why you would have, unless you, you've, you're really using some really cheap design that's been proven for years and that's just out there and that you just you know, want to spend no time on at all. You just grab whatever is the cheapest board and you put it into your printer and it, has, it happens to have a Lego drivers or a TI drivers. Mm. Unless you're doing that, I don't think there's a reason to decide on using Allegro TI or, or those other ones. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, it's... And if, yeah, and for, for, the, for the current, uh, Trinamic drivers don't have enough current kind of thing. that They do now have the 2209, which are like 1.8 or 2, way more than enough current drivers. Mm. I, I and, kind of think that uh, <laughs> the Cetus uses a similar control board than a couple of other printers from uh, how are they called? Uh, is, uh, is it just give me one second. How's the company true. called behind the uh, tier time? Yeah, tier time, yeah. Tier time. Um, still, so they 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 increase the price from the old uh, Mark II Cetus to the Mark III from 300 to 400 bucks. So I'm kind of upset and I don't really know um, what I should think about that because I think if they would use uh, yeah, more silent drivers, this would be a way better machine because a as of now, I'm kind of hesitant to put it into my office and print things on it while I'm working in, in here because I get easily distracted and this is something that would distract me. Yeah. So uh, I don't know why they, I don't know. Can you make a, a, a guesstimate what a control board with such, a, with what a control board costs more with Trinamic drivers compared to just the normal Polulu, uh, not Polulu, Allegro uh, 4988? Is it five um, bucks? Is it 10 bucks? Is it 30 in, bucks? In components, it's probably somewhere between... Well, it's probably in the in the ten bug range. Okay. So ten euros, dollars, whatever. Yeah. At most. Yeah. Well, who knows if the if the Lego drivers they're using they're getting it like some back mm. alley vendor that has uh, super low prices with them. But yeah. it's in the grand scheme of the machine, it's mm. not it's not a huge difference, mm. right? They are um, actually but, using not the standard Lego drivers. They are using different ones that can also be used, for example, for sensorless homing. So those aren't the, so it's the those. cheapest okay. ones on the market. So uh, it's just bad. And I, I don't know. Um, I actually it's, don't have an Ender 3 or something that, like that. Do you know if the cheaper uh, Creality and Ender 3 clones, do they nowadays come with more silent stepper motor drivers or still the kind of old mm -hmm. ones? So some printers you can, I think, order as an option with uh, Trinamic drivers or Trinamic clone drivers, mm. uh, knockoffs. But by default, they still come with uh, Allegro chips. Okay. Now, you, you did also ask about uh, implementation. Like, mm. is it extra effort to to use those, uh, to use Trinamics? And the thing is with, yeah, you, you should pay a bit of attention to matching your motors with the drivers mm. and, and maybe just try three different models and pick the one that you like the most. <laughs> That's that's that. But as far as interfacing goes, um, most of the Trinamic chips, and you can definitely select one that that does support that. Uh, you know, you can configure them without any extra firmware or software work. They just run off of 
uh, you know, your external potentiometer or voltage reference mm. um, for current, uh, you give them step direction enable and that is it. You don't need to use like all the fancy features mm. and even stuff like DK modes uh, or DK modes, you can, uh, you can still configure those with mm. pins. So I don't yeah. know. Maybe maybe just like one this. question on the side because I don't have any clue what you were talking about. What is what's what's the difference between a matched stepper driver to an unmatched stepper uh, to an unmatched stepper motor? So what difference in performance or noise would I see if I use a matched stepper motor on a trinamic driver to an unmatched one? So what you're going to be getting is, um, I mean, typically it's it's the same on all the other drivers. They they just work better with a certain type of motor. Um, you're going to get micro steps that sound a bit harsher. You're going to hear, or you're going to hear the full steps a bit more. Mm -hmm. You may also get whining, mm -hmm. um, just that high pitched noise that old people can't hear anymore. So they'll, which is actually a real problem. If you have old people designing circuits like that, if they if they design three D <laughs> printers, they might just put. You know, that, that combination in there that with a printer that winds like crazy. Mm. What, what printer have I seen that with? Some printer I've, I've seen that with where, where, where the, the folks were actually shocked that the printer winds so lightly. I think PQ machines actually wind like crazy, um, or the Woodbox 2 did. And they were like, what? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what was the question? <laughs> what's the difference but i think you kind of yeah. answered that but do you yeah, also get better like accuracy of the steps or of the micro steps do you get higher torque yeah well you you get more heat uh in the driver okay with uh well typically with a uh, with a depends depends on how the driver is designed um you get more heat and uh the is it do you get more accuracy in your micro steps is the same thing as do you hear the steps more? Mm -hmm. So if you have motors that that really have that audible zzzz noise mm -hmm. to them, then you do have a relatively, or you do have a non-linear motion in there, which means mm -hmm. that the micro steps aren't perfectly on point. Okay, cool. Thanks for the insight. Yeah, just a, a, a bit of electrical engineering background as, as much <laughs> as I still have it. <laughs> uh... If I if I would have the possibility, uh, I would really like to like do do a bachelor's or master's in electrical engineering at some point because uh, this is something where I still just lack so much knowledge. It's not it's not only studying; it's also just working in that field for a bit. But just sometimes I find that background really interesting, but uh, it's hard for me to just read books and learn about that <laughs> yeah um but you know for, for me it's always been you know the, the school or university system is not the way that i like to learn it's not the way that i like or enjoy or am capable of learning yeah i just i pulled myself through my bachelor's and, and I decided okay that's it like <laughs> from from here on out everything i learn is going to be different <laughs> so uh, i don't i don't know how you are about that but I just well, it's it. I think it's kind of different because I really always enjoy um, hearing lectures. It I I could do that all day if it's interesting stuff. That's the reason why I why I I've been using YouTube in the past a lot just for for learning stuff. I really enjoy and it's an efficient way for me to learn things if people are talking about different things and i don't have to read them on my own and yeah i don't know everybody's okay. different but uh, i I, yeah, sure. I enjoy that i also know people that never go to any lecture and then just learn everything from from a book for me it's totally different i take like 60 percent of my knowledge from the lectures it really depends on you know in, in university on your yeah. professor though yeah. if, if you have someone who's just like reading off something yeah. or doesn't really care uh, yeah, so I've, I've had lectured bo mm. lectures both ways, where it was just like, dude, I, mm. I don't, I don't, I don't need this. Mm. I need this in my life. And others where mm. where the professor was really good and really, you know, mm. explaining stuff well. Oh well. Yeah, there are some really interesting lectures on the Open Courseware prog uh, program, which is is it from the MIT or something like that, where I 
took lots of maths classes before I started my numerical engineering master. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 totally re I relearned all of the stuff about te about tensor calculation and things like these. <laughs> I enjoyed watching them. I just uh, wrote down everything they did in the lecture. And this was the way I learned efficiently. I'm just horrible in l reading stuff and then just learning from that. I don't know. I, I, I always need to put stuff to use. Yeah. I, I need to have like a, a, a concrete uh, application for something. Or at least, you know, stuff being presented in a way where, where I can see a concrete application for yeah. it. If it's, if it's just like some, I mean, math, yeah. Math was actually, we had a really good professor and I actually saw how many of the concepts were, were going to be useful. And, and I think that kind of dragged me through it. Yeah. But that stuff, I was just like, okay, what, what is this stuff? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so usually, usually what I'll do is, is I'll set, up with, set out with, okay, I, I, I want to do this. So how can I make it work? Yeah, and for me, it's just reading up hours and hours on on topics. Yeah, yeah. The, the rabbit hole. <laughs> Everyone is different. Yeah. All right. Should we answer one last question? Yes, we should. So, Elias S was asking, question for the podcast: Do you think that PETG will overtake PLA in terms of the most popular standard filament? Nope. Nope. <laughs> okay. So thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you all for watching. And yeah, should we still answer that question or what? <laughs> is it, what? What is it? I think I feel like we've answered that before. Oh uh, yeah. So if if you're interested on that topic, uh, I I'll I'll put a link to the podcast in the description where we talked about um, if we prefer PLA over PTG. And yeah, both of yeah. us still enjoy using PLA. It's just so simple. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for watching, I guess. Uh, listening or whatever. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for your time. Um, for the viewers out there, we always have the links in the description or podcast. What is it? Po podcast, podcast notes. Also that. Um, check those out. And we're, we also have the links to where you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all those platforms everything down there watch or listen to us there not on youtube if you can and yeah yeah we will see you all in a bit a bit three not sure weeks. when yet but <laughs> we'll keep going all right this was episode 20 goodbye goodbye <laughs>